I'm Tim Stratton with Free Thinking Ministries, and today we're going to continue our discussion on the providence of God. Namely, uh, how is it that the Bible seems to teach two truths that, at least at face value, are in contradiction with each other? I think from cover to cover, it's clear that the Bible uh, affirms that God is in control of all things. This is what we call the providence of God or the sovereignty of God. That God's in control of all things, yet also according to that same Bible is the affirmation that humans are free and responsible for at least some things. So if God is in control of all things and humans are free and responsible for some things, isn't that a contradiction? Note the all versus the some. Well, we've been discussing how God has different possible worlds that are available to him to create. And, and actually, possible worlds and feasible worlds. And This all gets kind of uh, confusing, thinking about all these uh, different kinds of worlds. And what's the difference between possible worlds and feasible worlds? And I was thinking about this last night. Maybe this will help. But I want you, I want you to think about the color, uh, a color that you've never seen before, right? You don't, you don't even know if, if it exists or not, or even if it could exist. Let's just say it doesn't exist in this world, but it could exist in another possible world. Well, let's call this color schmurple. <laughs> the color schmurple, okay? Now, let's suppose this this schmurple color exists in another possible world, but for some reason, God decides that the world that he does create, well, that world will not have the color schmurple in it. He doesn't want that color added to the rainbow. Okay, so, so uh, he decides that he will only consider worlds that don't possess the color schmurple. So now, you see, God has chosen, if this, in this thought experiment, God has chosen to limit his options, you see. Well, in a similar way, this isn't a perfect analogy, but it might help you to think things through. In a similar way, once we factor in a human libertarian free will, if that's important to God, if God uh, says, you know, so to speak, I, it is important for me to give my creatures, the creatures that I create, to be redundant there, to give humans libertarian free will so that they can love, so that they can be rational, so that they can be moral. If I give humans libertarian free will, that's important to me, so I will only consider worlds now where I create creatures who I don't always causally determine. I don't always determine their every uh, thought or action or belief or behavior. So, now God has chosen to limit his worlds, the, the worlds available to him to create, by his choice, by his free choice. So now, although there are other possible worlds, once he makes that decision that libertarian free will is important to him, and I use the, the words once and things like that uh, loosely. I don't mean those literally, because we're talking about a state of affairs in which um, God doesn't think things through one after another. This is... Uh, we've talked about God's middle knowledge, so he knows all these things. But to use uh, human language here, um, just English in general, uh, once he decides that libertarian free will is important, then he has chosen to limit his options. So, once we factor in human liber libertarian free will, we learn that there is a group of worlds out of all the possible worlds that God can choose from. And again, those are called feasible worlds. He knows exactly what would happen in each world if he were to create it. Now, notice what I said there. God knows exactly what would happen in each world if he chose to create it. Not what will happen once he creates it. That's a different mode, okay? There's a difference between would and will, and it's vital to understand this distinction. God knows everything that could, would, and will happen. And logically prior to creating any world, God knows what would happen in any of these possible worlds 
if he were to take one of these worlds and make them the actual world. Now these worlds, they're just possible worlds. That just means that God knows what he could do. Given his omniscience, he knows everything that's available for him to do within his omnipotence. That's all it is. And this is all logically prior to his creative decree to create the universe or the actual world. So he knows exactly what would happen in each world if he were to create it. God then chooses to create one of these worlds from this group. And, and that's because one of these worlds is available to him. All these worlds are available to him since he's omnipotent. But then he can actualize it and make it a real thing, not just something he knows he could do. So let's think about some examples of worlds. Let's take three of these worlds. Uh, just random three here. Uh, we'll call this world one, world two, and world three. We've got our three worlds that God is uh, considering right here. So let's consider three stories of what happens in each world. Now, uh, God only knows if he really can create these worlds. They're just examples. But one of them might not be just an example. Let's take a look. Consider world one. Instead of Adam and Eve, God makes Zadam and Zeev. Uh, Adam, or Zadam and Zeev are talking dragons. God wants them to freely love him. He tells them that he loves them, but they choose to disobey him. Now, these dragons, Zadam and Zeev, have dragon children, and their children have children, and the world soon becomes full of dragons. Now, God gives them many miracles and signs every day to show them that he still cares about these dragons, and he wants them to come back to him. For example, he even writes his name in the sky and tells these dragons that he loves them in the sky. But some of these dragons freely choose to love him, but most don't care. In the end, only very few dragons freely choose to love God, or I should say, very few dragons, uh, well, I should say, most of the dragons freely choose to resist God's love and grace. So, that's a possible world, it seems. I don't see any logical contradictions. It's kind of crazy talking about talking dragons. But it seems possible that God has the power to create that kind of a world. We're just going to call that world one. What about world two? What happens in, in this world? <clears throat> well, in this world, God makes millions of talking unicorns in the beginning. And God tells them that he loves them and tells these unicorns to obey him. Now, some of these unicorns do, but many freely choose to disobey God and become evil unicorns. God commands the good unicorns to go tell the bad unicorns that he still loves them and he wants them to repent. But the bad unicorns kill all the good unicorns and none are left. The bad unicorns become more and more evil and in the end, they all hate each other and kill each other. Well, that's possible world too. You think God would want to create that world? I don't think so. But let's consider world three, another possible world. God creates Adam and Eve. He tells them that he loves them and tells, and tells them to obey him. But they freely choose to disobey. Now, Adam and Eve have children, and soon the world becomes full of of sinful people. God then chooses a nation called Israel, and he knows that through what the Israelites freely choose to do, that many people in the world will become ready to believe in Jesus when he finally comes to die for their sins. God also knows that in the future, billions of non-Christians would freely choose to love and obey God as Christians freely choose to spread the news about Jesus to the whole world. 
In the far future, Jesus comes back. God raises the dead back to life. God finally judges everyone. And God makes the whole world perfect again forever. And in this world, humans learn from their mistakes. Just like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.17, these light momentary afflictions prepare us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now this is a possible world, and I think it's the actual world. You see, if God possessed all the knowledge about everyone's free choices, then God can predestine all of this to occur exactly as it does occur, and that includes how you will freely choose with no strings attached. There's no strings attached, natural strings or supernatural strings, forcing you to always think, act, believe, and behave exactly as you do think, act, believe, and behave. But God doesn't have to determine those things to predestine these things, if he is really omnipotent and omniscient. So here's some important things to learn. Each of these worlds, world one, world two, and world three, describes people acting freely in a libertarian sense. Now, let me make a side note here and, and try to define what I mean by libertarian free will. Um, there's several definitions that are in play here. Uh, I wrote an article called What is Libertarian Free Will? I encourage you to go take a look at that. Uh, the, the definition I like to use, it's kind of technical, is uh, libertarian free will is the thesis that uh, compatibilism is false along with the affirmation that sometimes <coughs> we are free. Um, now, that, what's compatibilism? Uh, compatibilism is the view that God determines everything, but somehow you're still free and responsible for some things. Now, when you really catch that out, I, I think that is incoherent nonsense. right? <laughs> but, but libertarian free will uh, is at least the idea that um, you at least occasionally are not determined by something that is not you. And that includes your nature, right? If, so, if something uh, determines your nature to be in such a way that it guarantees you will always act in such a way, then you're not responsible for that. Uh, but if some things are ever really up to you, then we say that you have a libertarian free will. Now, I like to even argue for more than that. And a lot of people would say that libertarian free will is the ability to choose otherwise, at least occasionally. And I do argue for that position, but most libertarians would say that only the first thing is required. Only the first thing is necessary for libertarian free will. That you are a first mover, at least occasionally, or a first thinker, at least occasionally. That, you, that, that nothing external to you is is causally determining all of your thoughts, actions, beliefs, and behaviors. That is the most important. But I think it's also important to say that at least sometimes we have the ability to think otherwise or to believe otherwise. Uh, I've written a whole bunch on that on my website if you want to go surf around. I have another article on freethinkingministries.com called Can We Choose Our Beliefs? So take a look at that. But anyway, I argue for both of those. But I would say the first ingredient that... Uh, we're not determined by something external to us. Uh, that is necessary. And the second thing, that we have an ability to at least choose otherwise occasionally, is sufficient. That is to say, if that part is true, then it's game over. Libertarian free will exists. So, I do think the Bible makes it clear that at least sometimes we can think otherwise. All right, here's some important things to learn from those three worlds that we just discussed, though. Again, each world describes, describes people acting freely. But God knows even before or logically prior to creating any world what they would do. So even if God chooses not to create any world, he still knows that he's powerful enough to create beings that he doesn't always control. So if God is powerful enough to create free creatures, he, if he's, if he's omni or omniscient, then he would also know how these free creatures would freely choose to act if he were to create them, even if he never creates them. 
Okay, does this blow your mind? All right, now, so it's just saying that if God is omnipotent and omniscient, then he, he has the power to create free creatures, and he knows how these free creatures would behave even if he never creates them. So if that's the case, then some flavor of Molinism is true. I'll get back to that. Here's the deal. Let me say it again. God knows even before or logically prior to creating any world what free creatures would freely do. God knows even how he will freely interact with free creatures in that world if he creates it. So he knows that if Justin freely chooses to pray, God knows how he will freely interact with that prayer. So he even knows how he will freely respond. Now, some people say, well, if God knows all this, doesn't that determine it? No, because knowledge does not stand in a causal relation any more than an infallible weather barometer that knows it will rain in Spain 100 years from now doesn't cause the rain in Spain 100 years from now. Knowledge doesn't cause things to happen. And when you think of it this way, knowing how one will freely choose does not entail that it was not freely chosen. The knowledge is irrelevant. You remove the knowledge and nothing changes, you see, because it's still freely chosen. Once God creates a world, he knows everything that will happen and everything that will freely happen, including what God himself will freely do. Again, just because God knows what one will freely choose does not entail that it was not freely chosen. Because God already decided to do it when, he, when choosing a world to create, so after creating the world, he never changes his mind. <clears throat> now, let's look at examples of God's providence in the Bible, or at least one right now. I've got uh, several examples on the website. Uh, William Lane Craig has probably even more on reasonablefaith.org. But let's just look at one right now. First Chronicles 10.4 implies that Saul freely committed suicide. That Saul killed himself. But 10 verses later in 10.14, it says... God killed Saul. Well, which one is it? A lot of times you'll, you'll have atheists say, look, this is a contradiction, therefore the Bible can't be true. Or at least inerrant. We've got ten verses apart from each other. A contradiction right here. Paul killed himself. God, or not Paul. Saul killed himself. Or God killed Saul. Well, which one was it? Well, if you've ever seen Return of the Jedi, Obi-Wan Kenobi comes to talk to Luke on Dagobah, and, and Luke's like, Ben, why didn't you tell me that Darth Vader killed, or, or why did you tell me that uh, Darth Vader killed and murdered my father, when the truth is, Darth Vader is my father? And Obi-Wan says, well, what I told you was true, from a certain point of view. It looks like a certain point of view? What? You know, <laughs> and, uh, now, maybe not the perfect analogy, but that's to get you thinking here. You see, both of those verses, 1 Chronicles 10.4 and 10.14, are both true, but it depends on how you look at it from a certain point of view. You see, Saul did freely choose to kill himself. God didn't do anything to him supernaturally, or he didn't give him a, a suicide-loving nature. <laughs> he, he allowed Saul to freely make choices that he did not cause or determine. There's no strings attached. You see, Saul was genuinely responsible for committing suicide. But... God created Saul knowing that Saul would freely choose to kill himself in this situation, in this world. So in a sense, you can say God killed him because he created a world in which he knew that Saul would freely choose to kill himself. You see, this is the, the distinction or the difference between predestination and causal determinism. <clears throat> 
Did God determine or cause Saul to kill himself? No. Did he predestine it? Yes. And there's a difference. Now, let's think more about our world, the world that God actually created. God chose this world for good reasons. You know, I, I like to say that this world is probably the best of all feasible worlds. Kirk McGregor uh, would say that this, uh, this world is maybe one tied for the best of all possible worlds. But there could be uh, many tied for the best possible or feasible worlds. When you think about it, having a best of all possible worlds, I don't know if that makes sense. It doesn't make sense to me anymore. Or anyway, it seems that you could always, you know, if this is a world where 100 people are saved for eternity, then there's another world where uh, a million people are saved for eternity. Then you could say, well, here's a world where 2 million are saved for eternity. Well, you, if, if people being, if humans being saved for eternity is uh, what's most important to God, which I think would be a fair assumption to make, <clears throat> according to, in, in God's economy anyway, that <clears throat> that's what's most valuable to him. It seems like you can just always add one more. And so I don't know if uh, the greatest of all possible worlds in that sense uh, makes sense. But once you factor in human libertarian freedom, I think it makes sense to say, well, there could be a world in which the maximal number of people freely choose to love God. That makes sense to me. Um, but even if it's not just one, I would say there's a range of options available for God that are all equally good. <clears throat> and so God uses his libertarian free will to choose one of them. Now, I would say there's at least two worlds that I can think of that would be optimally good or, or you know, the kind of world that God would want to create. Um, either the world that we live in, which I think would be a world that's either the most where the most people freely choose to love God in return for eternity, or God just remaining in his static state of aseity in a perfect love relationship with the Trinity. To deny that that world is equally great as this world would be to say that, I think, that God needed us in some way. And I think that's a heresy. I don't think we can go down that road. So you've got to say that this world is at least tied for the best with a state of affairs in which God exists alone as a trinity. Does that make sense? So, so God picks one to either remain as a trinity um, in a static state of a It doesn't really make sense to say forever because there's, I'll just say, yeah, there's no time. Um, or to create the space-time universe. Raises more questions we'll get to later. All right, but God chose this world freely, and he had good reasons. And he knew before he made the world what people would do, or that people would do good and evil. Now, God always wants people to do good things, or should I say loving things. He wants us to love each other. He wants us to love him first and to love all people from your neighbors to those who consider you to be an enemy as yourself. It's all about love. Love, love, love. As God created you on purpose and for the specific purpose to love all persons. <clears throat> He's omnibenevolent. So God always wants people to do loving things. God never wants people to do bad things or evil things or hateful things, but God lets them do it. He, he gives them free will so that true love can be attained. But if free will is really free and not some word game, then people can use that same ability, that libertarian freedom to choose to love in a backwards kind of way and do evil. And again, that's easy to remember because love spelled backwards, is evil. <laughs> yeah. Not the best speller, but you get the point. He gives us freedom, and he lets us do evil things. Because good things would happen from these bad things. And God knows it. 
even if it happens much later, even if it happens on the other side of eternity. Again, I think of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. These light momentary afflictions, whether they're called, caused by the evil that people do or uh, natural evil, tornadoes and hurricanes, whatever, God knows all of this affliction and suffering that we experience here in this world prepares us for eternity. Oh, we will not take eternity in heaven with God for granted. Adam, Eve, Satan, and a third of all the angels did. They were created in a perfect state of affairs and took it for granted. Will you? I, for one, will not because I've experienced suffering here and I'm aware of all the suffering that goes on around this planet. Even what seems to be gratuitous. Man, I'm not going to take any, I'm not going to take heaven for granted because no suffering exists, including gratuitous suffering. Or what, at least what seems to be gratuitous from our perspective. God has eternity in mind. We ought to do the same. But God has this knowledge of what would happen and even what will happen after we freely choose to do bad, evil, hateful things. And he knows that good will come from it. Maybe this world, the actual world, has the most amount of good and the least amount of evil. You see, God is in control of everything that happens without controlling everything that happens. If Molinism is true, let me say it again. God is in control of everything that happens without controlling everything that happens. Because before anything happens, God already chose to create this world knowing it would happen. He has reasons for either making or letting it happen. And that includes all of your free choices. God knows what he's doing. He never makes mistakes. Because of that, you can trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path, your paths straight. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You see, this scripture tells us that we can trust in the Lord with all our heart. But it's hard. It's hard to trust God on some of these other views of God's sovereignty. I mean, if God causally determines everything about you, then you trusting in the Lord is not up to you. That's up to God. And yet, does it make sense to hold you responsible for something God's responsible for? If he's, if he's the one that causes everything about you and determines everything about you? Well, and there's other views of God, too, like open theism. The open theist would say, well, God just doesn't have knowledge of what would happen uh, or what would or will happen. Well, if that's the case, then we've got a Forrest Gump view of God. <laughs> and it'd really be hard to trust the Forrest Gump God uh, I mean, Forrest Gump is like, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Well, if God doesn't know what would happen if he chooses to create a world, then that's exactly what kind of God we're left with. He, he never knows what he's going to get. He opens the box of chocolates and finds out and has to deal with it. That'd be hard to trust that kind of God, too. But if you remember when we studied the ontological argument, we talked about the maximal greatness of God. Now, even if you don't like the ontological argument, what's helpful about it is that it can at least help us understand how Christians should think about God. That God is a maximally great being. If God is a maximally great being, then oh, he's trustworthy. And I should say, easy to trust once you understand God's nature. Yeah, if God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, what I call the big three, oh, think about that. A God who is powerful enough to do anything logically possible. A God who 
knows the pro, you know the truth value to every proposition that you could ever ask him, and a God who's so powerful and so intelligent and who loves you perfectly, desires the best for you. Huh. That's a God that is easy to trust, even when I don't understand everything. With God's maximal greatness in mind, I have argued quite uh, vigorously against a certain view of God's sovereignty, uh, one that I refer to as uh, divine determinism. Typically, uh, many Calvinists would hold this view, and I think it's uh, false and demonstrably false when we consider God's nature. It's not an argument about what humans deserve or anything like that, so don't attack a straw man. Right? This is about God's nature. And when we think about God's nature, some things become quite clear. Let me end with an argument. I call it the omni argument because it is focused on God's nature and his omni attributes. Premise one, if irresistible grace is true, that's uh, the I of the acronym TULIP. I've written a lot on this on my website if you are new to this uh, concept. But if the means of salvation is via irresistible grace alone, where God gives you a grace in such a way that it is impossible to resist it, and you will become saved no matter what. Okay? If irresistible grace is true, then for any person X, if God desires to, has the power to, and knows how to cause X to go to heaven and not suffer eternally in hell, then X will go to heaven and not suffer eternally in hell. Premise two. If God is omnibenevolent, omnipotent, and omniscient, then for any person X, God desires to, has the power to, and knows how to cause X to go to heaven and not suffer eternally in hell. Premise three. There is at least one person who will not go to heaven and suffers eternally in hell. Probably a lot more. Step four, conclusion. Therefore, one cannot logically affirm both, one, that irresistible grace is true, and two, that God is omnibenevolent, omnipotent, and omniscient, a maximally great being. If one's going to affirm irresistible grace is how we are saved, then you've got to deny at least one, if not all, of God's omni-attributes. Five, God is a maximally great being. Six, conclusion, therefore, irresistible grace is false. Seven, therefore, divine determinism is false. God does not causally determine all things. For example, you can resist his grace. You can resist his love. Eight, God is completely sovereign, and does predestine all things. That's biblical. Nine, conclusion. Therefore, predestination and determinism are not to be conflated. They are not the same thing. That's the big problem today. Behind the doors of the church is far too many people read what's in the Bible that God predestines all things and jump to the conclusion, well, that must mean that he causally determines all things. No, that's not true. Now, we can even make an argument from that based on the original languages, but I've just offered a logical argument showing the same thing. Now, I have one more abductive conclusion at the end. The best explanation of all the data is Molinism. Right? Once we consider everything in that argument, and we consider the Bible as a whole, from cover to cover, Molinism makes sense of all the data, all the theological, it connects all the theological and logical dots. 
It doesn't prove that Molinism is true. But I'm telling you, out of all the views out there, Molinism is the inference to the best explanation of all the data. And I would say is the inference to the best interpretation of the Bible as a whole. I've written a ton on this on my website. Go to freethinkingministries.com to check out more. And thank you for joining us today. Stay reasonable and God bless.